Coming up on Windows Weekly, I, Micah Sargent, am subbing in for Leo Laporte, and we have a great panel today. Of course, Mary Jo Foley, but also Zach Bowden, the senior editor of Windows Central and managing editor at XDA, Rich Woods. Yes, this is a jam-packed show with two great guests. First, we talk about uh, the next version or versions of Windows. Uh, Microsoft has a whole new schedule put in place for how Windows will roll out every three years, new major drops and then some small ones in between. Then the canceled Surface Duo and uh, Zach Bowden's thoughts on the Duo in general. Microsoft working with Netflix and some really important announcements from the Inspire Conference before we take some questions from the audience and round things out with picks, tips, apps, and drinks of the week. Stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is Twit. Twit. This is Windows Weekly, episode 786, recorded Wednesday, July 20th, 2022. Windows Ventura. This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by SecureWorks. Are you ready for inevitable cyber threats? SecureWorks detects ever-changing threats and defends against them with a combination of security analytics and human intelligence. To learn more, visit secureworks.com. And by ClickUp, the productivity platform that'll save you one day a week on work, guaranteed. Use code WINDOWS to get 15% off ClickUp's massive unlimited plan for a year, meaning you can start reclaiming your time for under $5 a month. Sign up today at ClickUp.com. Hurry, this offer ends soon. And by Infrascale. Infrascale delivers industry-leading data protection through backup and disaster recovery. Whatever your data or environment, Infrascale provides continuity and resiliency for your business. Visit infrascale.com slash twit to get the free ebook, Five Essential Components of a Ransomware Protection Plan, and learn how to protect your business today. It is time for Windows Weekly. Yes, I, Micah Sargent, am in today while Leo Laporte is on a cruise. And uh, it is time to talk to some incredible Windows watchers. Up first, it is the one and only Mary Jo Foley. How are you doing, Mary Jo? I'm good. I'm not on the cruise, so I'm here in 101 degree New York City today. It's excellent. Oh, <laughs> I am so sorry. I actually don't know what the temperature is here, but I know it's uh, it's not cool. I can feel that for sure. It's not yeah. cool. Um, yeah, you aren't on the cruise, and I'm happy because that means that this show gets to be something different than it usually is. And I don't even know if we're yep. going to talk about Xbox today. It's going to be. Ooh, I don't know. I don't know where we're going exactly, but um, I believe. <laughs> that you have some uh, guests that you brought onto the show. So tell us about that. I do. I have two guests today. And people in the Windows world know we're a very tight community, us Microsoft watchers. So all of us know each other really well. And my idea for this show was, let me bring on some people who, if we were just sitting around in a pub, say Rattle and Hum, any pub, um, (laughs) these would be the people I would want to be chatting with. So first, I've got my friend Rich Woods, who is the managing editor of XDA. He also, not everyone knows this, he's also the 2015 Lumia Personality <laughs> of the Year. I, yep. Not everyone knows this. He knows, <laughs> Rich knows everything about phone cameras. He knows everything about chips. Whenever I need a question answered about Intel roadmaps, AMD roadmaps, Qualcomm, I call Rich. And he knows a lot about baseball. All three of these things are something I know very little about. So he's a handy guy to have around. That's guest one. Guest two is our friend, Zach Bowden. He is a senior editor at Windows Central, but he's way more than just that. He's also a Microsoft prototype hunter. He's a dual screen enthusiast, and he is the aficionado of rounded corners. We will make fun of him about all three of these things during today's show. Thanks for having me. (laughs) I mean, Mary Jo, you're regularly, uh, I hear you talk about these two on the show when you're, you know, Mm -hmm. talking about new bits of news uh, and, oh yeah, I heard from, and you, you, you know, have some, some little insights. So I I think it's a pretty awesome uh, panel you've got lined up here and uh, I I am looking forward 
to asking lots of questions, as is my shtick okay. at the very least on this show. Awesome. So uh, yeah, <laughs> how, how, how are we kicking things off today, Mary Jo? Well, this, is, this was a little bit of luck um, that we had. The, last week, our friend Zach broke a really big story. And when we had him lined up to come on the show today, we didn't know he was going to drop this story last week. <laughs> um, but Zach has some information from his sources. I actually should let him explain this about how the Windows schedule may change in the coming months and years. That. Yeah, so I guess we should just dive straight into it. So I heard yeah. a, a little while ago now at this point that Microsoft was changing up its development sort of cycle or schedule for Windows going forward. Um, and I started asking around about this because a couple of weeks back, Microsoft started testing build 22622 in the Insider beta channel. And they announced that as a sort of enablement package. And I was immediately sort of wondering why they were doing enablement package testing on Windows 11 so early on and into its life, right? You know, the enablement package stuff didn't start showing up on Windows 10 until, you know, a few years in. So why were they doing that now on Windows 11? I started asking around and that sort of opened up a, <laughs> I went down a rabbit hole that I was not expecting to go down and essentially found out from multiple sources at this point that Microsoft is um, moving away from its annual sort of major release of Windows and is moving to a major release every three years with feature drops in between. Now, they call the feature drops moments. We'll get to all of that in a minute. But the big news here is they are going back to one release every three years, similar to how they did Windows Vista to Windows 7 or Windows 7 to Windows 8. Uh, from Windows 11 to Windows 12, question mark. We don't know what that's going to be called, but that appears to be what they're sort of going for now, uh, starting in 2024. So Windows 11 came out in 2021. Three years later, 2024, that's when we can expect the next version of Windows. And that's pretty big news, at least to me, because we are going back to the sort of traditional development cycle for major versions of the OS. And will that be a good thing? I'm, I want to hear your guys' thoughts, because I, you know, I know what I think. What do you guys think? So... so um, <laughs> I know it is big news, but were, were you guys expecting this? Because I feel like I was waiting for this to happen at some point. Um, they've pretty much, I mean, we've had Windows as a service with Windows 10 that was originally planned to be the, the last version of Windows. Um, and then something happened where PCs got popular again. They did. They needed something to make Windows exciting again. They did Windows 11. And I think when Windows 11 happened, it was clear that Windows 12 was going to happen at some point. And then now we're starting to see they're releasing features in many different ways. Uh, insider testing is kind of a mess. You're in different channels. You might get features, you might not. Now there's an enablement package where you can choose to get new features. Um, and it's, it's so much of a mess that you kind of have to start to ask, does it make sense to do yearly updates anymore? Windows 10 is still doing yearly updates with enablement packages and they don't even have features. <laughs> it's just like to introduce a new a new support lifecycle. Like they could just have the same update and say it ends in 2025. Like this stuff doesn't make sense to do anymore. So um, knowing that there would eventually be a Windows 12, I think every three years made sense. And I, I, I was kind of waiting for this to, to happen eventually. Do you guys agree or? You no? know. What, Mary Jo? No, not really. No? Because. Okay. <laughs> Well, okay, so last year they made a huge deal out of having this once, once a year update, right? Like, right. And all the IT people were like, yes, that's what I wanted. I wanted them to only do one update a year. And they had a whole elaborate explanation. They did it for Windows 10, Windows 11. And now it's like, oh, wait, no, actually, just forget that, right? Like, we're going to But go I think things have even changed years. since then, though, don't, don't you? They have. Yeah, they yeah. have. No, because in February, I think it was February, Panos, remember that blog post when they started talking about, by the way, we can drop features anytime we want. Remember that blog post? And it right. was like, yeah. wait, okay, so we're going to have one update a year, but you can actually drop features whenever you want. So what's the one update a year even mean? Right. <laughs> right. 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 Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Because they, the first yeah. one was the Windows sub subsystem for Android in the Amazon yeah. App Store. But they they announced right. this with the Windows 11 launch. It yeah. didn't launch with Windows 11, and then it, it's like, well, yeah, uh, I guess I guess we'll have it later this year. Well, we're not going to say when we're going to have it actually, but yeah. um, maybe not the next feature. It's like, what? What are you guys even talking about? So, <laughs> so yeah. yeah, so that arrived at some point. It comes to the store, and they have uh, web. Feature experience packs. I don't even know the names of all these feature experience no. packs. No one does. <laughs> but there's no so many knows. ways of dropping new features that that what is that that once a year feature update even there for anymore? I know. Right. I agree. 
Um, okay, so let's let's play devil's advocate. There, I, on the negative side, this takes away predictability, right? So that's the one thing IT loves, predictability. Mm -hmm. It's like suddenly it's like, we, we knew you could drop features anytime, but now you're saying, Zach's story, the moments thing, even that name is so right. stupid. Moments? Really? <laughs> like, come on. It sounds like... Uh, that's on brand for Microsoft. <laughs> it's like Snapchat <laughs> stories, but inside of Microsoft. It, it is a very yeah. strange yeah. name for it. No, it's a, such a PR name, right? Because sometimes <laughs> I feel like when Microsoft's doing something, they say, we're ca they call it a moment. Like, we're having a moment mm. about, you know, AI or whatever. Okay. So anyways, forget this, how weird the yeah. name is. But they it's might okay. have these yeah. drops every four... For up to four times a year. Okay, so there will right, be, a, yeah. Zach's, Zach sources say, a new version, whatever that really means, a new, like, does it mean a whole new version where everything is different? Does it mean that just that you're going to have to reboot and you're not going to use an enablement package? We don't really even know what that means, right? And then you're going to have all these other updates dropping willy-nilly, like, is it going to be every quarter? Maybe. Or is it going to be like three of them? like back to back and then one at the end of the year. We don't know, right? Like, so on the negative yeah. side, I say this takes away predictability. Um, on the positive side, which is what I think, uh, this is stuff Panos and his team care a lot about. It brings excitement back, right? Like, oh, we're going to surprise you guys with new features. <laughs> I think also I Windows 12 brings excitement back. Just just the idea of having a new version of Windows. I mean, as as writers who are writing content about this stuff, we see yeah. that there is a ton more interest when they have an actual new version of Windows. Yeah, sure. And it is not the same amount of interest for a, a feature update to Windows. And I'm sure they see that and it, they like it when they can get people excited. Yeah. How does but, uh, Microsoft, so w one of the things that, you know, I, I'm always thinking about in terms of Different so an example is today uh, Amazon is doing its ALEXA live event, which is an mm -hmm. event for developers. But there's all these announcements of new ways the developers can make use of ALEXA and uh, do a bunch of fun stuff with that. Does Microsoft have events where they uh, where they announce specifically the new version of software? Is it typically the blog post idea where you go and you see mm -hmm. the new features there? Um, because that schedule of once a year versus every three years, um, that, that seems like a long time to wait between new versions of Windows. But, you know, I'm not in the Windows <laughs> camp regularly, so I can understand how that's different. Well, that's what the moments are going to be for, right? The, the moments really only exist to, to sort of keep Windows current when we have major updates coming from other platforms. Windows needs to keep current somehow, especially if there's only one major version every three years. So these moments are sort of step in and keep Windows up to date and fresh with new features up to four times a year, yeah, as Mary Jo mentioned. Uh, th that doesn't mean they will do it four times a year. They may only do it twice in one year or maybe once right. in one year. I think it will depend on what features they have lined up and ready to go. And it benefits Microsoft internally because, you know, these feature teams who are working on features all throughout the year have often had to wait for the annual release in the fall. If your feature is mm. done in January, that's kind of annoying, isn't it? Because you have to wait <laughs> for the rest of the year. With these moments, if your feature is done in January, we can say, right, when's the next moment? Oh, it's in February. Cool, we can line this feature up for February. And so these features get out sooner for these product teams as well. And then, of course, they can also start working and do major sort of investments to the platform for these major versions every three years because they now have a longer runway to make meaningful improvements to the OS rather than, you know, in six months, oh my God, we have another feature update we've got to do. What do we put in it? <laughs> and have no time to really actually make anything proper out of that. So there are benefits to it. It will be interesting to see how IT admins are allowed to control the moments aspects because I think IT admins will be happy with the uh, move to three years for major releases. And I'm not too sure how they're going to feel about the moments, possibly every few months. Assuming IT admins can control it, I think it'll be a bit better. But if they can't, that might be a problem, <laughs> right? Would it, right. <laughs> right? Would it be and accurate to to draw a comparison really quick? Would it be accurate to draw a comparison yeah. between uh, Android's Google Play services updates and this moments thing? Is that the idea that instead of uh, tying yeah. everything to a release cycle, you sort can like just a do it with a pixel feature needed. drop? Ah. Yeah, Pixel feature drop, exactly. That's okay. how it was described yeah. to me. It's essentially, look at what Google does with the Pixel. Every month or every couple of months, they will do a feature drop uh, outside of major versions of the Android OS. And, you know, they still get those every year, um, but there are individual features that show up for Pixel users. And the same can be said for Windows in these moments. Every few months, there'll be a few new features. I doubt there'll be huge changes to the UX and, yeah. and things that you have to relearn. I think these will just sort of include 
enhancements to the existing product. So things that make whatever you've got better rather than changing things drastically. I could be wrong about that. Who knows what they're planning? But I would be crazy for them to sort of do a Windows 8 style change in a moment, right? <laughs> no way would they change the UX that drastically. Um, right. But that's what they could say if the major releases for. If they wanted to build hype and a story around a major version of Windows, if they were planning to do any significant UX work that changed things around, they could save that for the major versions every three years. Yeah, I think this is going to be really good. I think I, I I think it may like like Zach said it, they they'll have a longer runway to put major major releases of Windows together. Uh, Windows eleven, we know it was kind of rushed. Um, it, it was put together in less than a year, um, and and now that we're seeing a feature update this year, that that's really just more of a complete version, and and features that were in Windows ten are coming back. So. Um, being able to plan that every three years, I think it's going to be good for everyone. Well, the one thing we don't know is the support time frame and how that's going to change, right? right? So just because they release a new version of Windows every three years, is that going to mean they support versions of Windows for three years? Because if it does, IT will love that, right? But what if it isn't that? What if it is... And you have to update to this group of moments in order to remain within hmm. support for the next year and a half or whatever. Like you can see them doing that, right? Like they're, they, Microsoft wants people to be on the latest version all the time because they feel like it makes people happier when they have the new features. At least that's what they say, right? So um, if, if you're the IT person, you're like, yeah, but how do I like make sure people are all on the same version and some may be on this version or that version. And then you have to figure out how long is it supported and like, how is that going to work? I, I just feel like it sounds fun from um, an announcement perspective and it makes it more exciting for us as the reporters because we're going to have more to write about. But if, like if you're the people trying to implement this across your company and especially if you're a big company, I think there are a lot of things that could go wrong. I bet the board yeah, ends up being. Show. <laughs> Is this though bet, then am, are Windows or Microsoft rather? There we go. They're all the names. Um, Is this <laughs> Microsoft's way of doing what you have been, which was odd coming from you, Mary Jo. Um, but I remember you talking, asking uh, at the end of the year about how, Microsoft was looking to be more for consumers at the time. And yeah. you asked, you know, what in this past year showed that uh, you were focusing mm -hmm. on that. Is this one of those things? Because it, as you said, it doesn't seem like it's very focused on the IT folks and the folks who are needing to make sure that this, yeah. uh, that they can support it. But instead, as a person who's not in that, who just has my Elvis laptop that I like to get new features on from time to time, as a seeker, as a seeker, yes, I this this is exciting. I'm I'm looking forward to all yeah. of these, and I think that the you know the the Microsoft or the Windows fans out there, of which there are many, um, will be excited about this. Is this a consumer facing uh, change to the schedule more so than a a, a company company change? I say yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it is. And, you know, when Panos took over Windows Client, I, Panos cares about Apple. That's who Panos cares about, mm. right? So <laughs> <laughs> to be very blunt. And he, he wants anything that Apple's doing, like if Apple's updating their new OS to t version 12 or t version 13, he wants to be right there, right? He, he thinks about things from a consumer perspective, for sure. Um, you know, the older guard at Microsoft that's not here anymore, um, some of them were very much more attuned to the needs of IT pros and businesses because that's Microsoft's bread and butter. And if you really care about that group of people, like what you're proposing here, it sounds like a nightmare to me. I don't know. <laughs> I th I understand the excitement part and like, you know, cool, we get new features and look at this. This is really nice. Um, but if you're, again, if you're somebody rolling things out through rings or trying to make it so that you don't have to retrain your employees on stuff like this, probably sets off a lot of alarm bells for you. I, th I, think it, I think it will depend on the kind of features they plan to roll out Agreed. through these moments, right? Because, you know, yeah. they sort of tested this with the weather button rolling out to Windows 11 earlier this mm -hmm. year. Back in February, they announced that, hey, we're, we're going to roll out weather button. There it is. It's on the taskbar mm -hmm. now. Uh, and that wasn't really, that wasn't part of the initial Windows 11 launch. And that wasn't part of, a you know, version 22H2. That was just rolled out in a, in a servicing style update for existing Windows 11 users. And mm -hmm. that I don't think really in, 
maybe interrupted people's workflows or how they use the OS. If it's features sort of like that, then I think maybe IT admins are going to have less of a problem with this. And again, if they can control these and how they roll out, then maybe it won't be so bad. It will come down to if, you know, if they make a significant change to the start menu, if they, if they shift icons over, if they, if they add something to it, that could be Mm -hmm. a problem. But would they want to do that in a moment or would they save that for a, for the major release every three years? Mm -hmm. These are the questions we don't know. And, you know, I don't really think Microsoft knows because, yeah. you know, I guess it will de- depend how they're feeling and, and what feature sort of fits in what product. And maybe if they ship with um, the moments features turned off by default, mm. right. um, yeah. that could calm people down too. Like, okay, if you want to try out this weather widget thing, you have to turn it on, consumer, right? Yeah, and I guess we can assume that these will sort of show up through these enablement packages, right? You know, they're already testing mm-hmm. 22622 with the beta channel, right. and that's what enables tabs in File Explorer. This is an enablement package, so, you know, you will download 22621, which doesn't have tabs in File Explorer. And then if you want to, air quotes, upgrade to the enablement package, which enables the tabs, then that's how you would go about that. And I assume IT admins can can control whether the user gets offered 22622 or if they stay or, or, or aren't offered it and have to stay on 22621. I assume maybe that's how it will be controlled. Mm-hmm. That would be better in terms of IT, right? If that works. <laughs> yeah, because both of those builds are serviced the same, right? If you look at when they announced yeah. the new beta channel builds, right. the 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 dot XXX number is exactly the same. So they're serviced identically, mm. just the 22622 mm. build is what turns features on. And so I guess the, the support lifecycle for both of those would be the same. Who knows? <laughs> but I, why would they make them different if they are basically the same build, just one turns things on and one turns things off, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. But do you guys actually think this is going to be called Windows 12, the next version? And here's here's why I'm asking you this. <laughs> I know. So so many people, when they read Zach's story last week, I know. the headline was Windows 12 coming in 2024. I'm like, so we have no idea if this is going to be called mm-hmm. Windows 12, right? Right. I mean, yeah. you would guess it could be, and I've heard from people it will be. But then, if you again, going back to IT, if you're an IT person, do you want to say, okay, wait, I just got on Windows 11 and here comes Windows 12, right? This, I think I this could be Windows this. Ventura. <laughs> <laughs> Windows Monterey. <laughs> hey, somebody else is doing that, aren't they? Although yeah. you know, maybe they'll take a cue from Apple. I don't know. <laughs> You know, I think it's too early for even Microsoft to know what they're going to call it. Yeah. Um, I think it would be a mistake for them to not market it as a new Windows product. Uh, whether that's Windows 12 or something more abstract like Windows Aurora remains to be seen. But I think it would be a mistake for them to just call it Windows 11 2024 edition, you know, because w- yeah. what is the point in waiting three years in that case? Just do them every year. You've been doing that for the last five years. Why would you have this stopgap suddenly yeah. if they're just going to be more Windows 11 updates? Um, so I I would like to think that this would be a air quotes Windows 12. We don't know if they'll actually use the number 12. It could be something else. But I do think you know, I am leaning more towards then marketing it as a new Windows product rather than an update to the existing Windows products. I think Windows 12 makes sense as well. I think, um, yeah, it's, it's like, simple, like I right? said before, yeah, I, yeah I, I think I think they were leading towards this when they when they did Windows 11, um, a new version of Windows, and then support life cycles will have, you know, a support life cycle for Windows 11 and then one for Windows 12. Um, yeah. And then that'll just, yeah, they'll, pro- they'll probably keep it as simple as possible because Microsoft's really good at that, you know. <laughs> And you know, I, yeah. I saw, <laughs> I saw, I saw a few people sort of go, "Oh, this is just going to be an excuse for them to increase the system requirements again." And you know, I had a look back at how Windows versions did it in the past. Not every new version of Windows up the system requirements. I'm pretty sure they stayed the yeah. same between Vista and Seven, and I think mm-hmm. they stayed the same between Seven and Eight as well. Windows Eleven was the first version of Windows in a long time to really up mm-hmm. those system requirements, and yeah. I don't think they're going to do that again for a number of years. So I wouldn't worry about the 2024 release being some, you know, if they require 11th gen chips and ups, that would be a mistake, I think. So I, I don't think that's yeah. going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah, the 12, the 12 it's, it's funny, Zach, Zach put in his story, he heard the code name for the next major version is New Valley NV. I heard the same thing from somebody else. Um, and when I heard the tip about New Valley, I initially was expecting it was going to be just another next feature Valley, update, right? right? 
Next Valley. Sorry, Next Valley. Next Valley. I, I was thinking that Next Valley code name, originally I was thinking that meant um, like Windows 11 23H2. Like I just thought it was going to be like one of those kind of more minor updates, you know? Yeah, the reason why I didn't think that is because the the, the version 23H2 that was planned was codenamed Sun Valley 3, which makes sense. It's a Windows oh, 11 update, yeah. Sun Valley. Yeah. The initial Windows 11 was Sun Valley 1. This year we're getting 22H2, which is Sun Valley 2. Next year would be Sun Valley 3. That makes sense. But with the shift to this new development cycle, I'd also heard that Sun Valley 3 was scrapped and many of the features mm -hmm. planned for that will now sort of ship in, the, in a series of moments throughout 2023. Um, so there's no major release of the Windows client next year, and then that leaves them that leaves them time to sort of develop for the 2024 release, which may or may not be uh, Windows 12. And it being uh, codenamed Next Valley, you know, I'm not Excellent. entirely sure if Next Valley is the actual codename. I think there might be a different codename for it specifically. Next Valley was just mm -hmm. what I essentially like Vnext. Like a lot of people refer yeah. to things as Vnext. Next Valley mm -hmm. is sort right. of that as well. Next yeah. Valley sort of stood out to me because if this was just going to be another Windows 11 update, why not codename it Sun Valley 4? Why would they go to the effort of saying Next Valley? That implies beyond Windows 11, right? So I think that sort of adds fuel to the fire regarding it being a Windows 12. You know, but I, again, like I said, it, I, I think it would be a mistake for them to not have this as a new Windows product, right? What would be the point otherwise? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I'm oh. I'm not liking change. I'm not a I'm not a big fan of change. And we've had Are you so change much change. Averse? I like it. We've had so <laughs> many changes in the way Windows is serviced and how often and the length of support. I'm just like, ugh, they can't decide and they just the goalposts keep changing and I'm like, I just figured this out and now we're gonna change it again. Okay. Yeah. I've I've heard yeah. from well, some it's, people it's, it's on sort of Sorry, go ahead, Rich. I heard I heard from some people on Twitter that they're hoping that this will be a new version of Windows where they roll back the new system requirements of Windows 11. And like, not just one person, like oh, this is gonna be the one where they take away the TPM requirements and everybody on Windows 10 that can't go to Windows 11 is gonna be able to go to Windows 12. And I think this is not what's what's happening. Yeah, for those people you know like who's just holding out hope <laughs> that they're gonna that roll not back. As crazy. That's, that's, no way. that's not as crazy as it sounds. I don't really? believe. Really? No, because, okay, think about this. The, those requirements, like we don't know what percentage of existing PCs can upgrade to Windows 11. We don't have any, I, I have never seen a right. number. Have you guys ever seen one? No. But there's probably quite a few that can't, right? And so- Probably the majority. What do you do, what do, you do with these people when it, when 2025 rolls around and there's no more Windows You tell them like, to buy new PCs, Mary Jo. Yeah. It's as simple as that. <laughs> no, I that's know. true. I mean, I mean, the, you gotta, you gotta think when, when, when Windows 11 launched, um, the 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 requirements were eighth gen Intel PCs, yeah. um, uh, Snapdragon 850, uh, you know Zen 2 AMD, I think. So so the oldest PCs that that could be upgraded were, or I should say the the newest PCs that couldn't be upgraded should, were like 2018. So um, you're still giving them a good. A good seven years of life out of their PC, and I think yeah. I think the expectation from Microsoft is that you should be uh, upgrading after that or run outdated software. Yeah, yeah. I don't All right, know. are we ready for a break yet? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Have we talked about everything possible that we could say about this? I'm sure we'll think of more things, but yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe that's good for that topic. <laughs> All right. Well, while you ponder on if there's more to say, we'll take a quick break so I can tell you all about SecureWorks, who are bringing you this episode of Windows Weekly. SecureWorks is a subsidiary of Dell. And you have this question, what would happen if an intruder broke into your home and moved in without you knowing it? Sneaking around, eating your food, using your Netflix account. Imagine an intruder doing the same thing to your IT infrastructure. How many passwords could they compromise? How many systems could they damage or degrade? How many pieces of personal or financial data could they steal? It's kind of harrowing. Threat actors often hide in plain sight in IT systems for more than 200 days on average before they are detected. What happens when stopping at the endpoint is stopping your ability to properly defend your infrastructure? Enter SecureWorks Tagus Extended Detection and Response. It enables a more comprehensive and effective security posture than ever before with one unified singular point of view providing unparalleled visibility. 
It's also extensible. So following data moving beyond the perimeter and helping organizations unify their prevention, detection, and response is right built in. It mitigates the issue of siloed security solutions that leave coverage gaps for the adversary to leverage by organizing multiple point solutions and creating one unified and clear picture of your infrastructure. Tejas XDR can help teams prevent threats effectively, detect them rapidly, and respond appropriately. And SecureWorks meets customers where they are with a managed XDR. You'll get a SaaS solution that can leverage the SecureWorks experts 24-7, 365 to investigate and respond to threats on your behalf. So that way you can cut dwell times, you can decrease operational burden and reduce cost. Some customers have a large security team and can manage XDR by themselves with minimal contact with the experts. But in most cases, companies have a shortage of security talent and they need the help of SecureWorks to help manage and monitor any potential threats to their environment. SecureWorks offers a purpose-built XDR solution designed to answer today's evolving security challenges, optimized by machine learning and deep detection capabilities, but refined through human intelligence and insights earned over decades of experience. A Gartner, Forrester, and IDC leader in security operations, SecureWorks empowers organizations with the collaborative and innovative security solutions required to achieve strong security in an evolving digital world. At SecureWorks.com, you can learn more about the ways today's threat environment is evolving and the risks it can present to your organization, including case studies, reports from their counter-threat unit, and more. Visit SecureWorks.com. SecureWorks. Be the threat. Beat the threat. Thanks so much to SecureWorks for sponsoring this week's episode of Windows Weekly. All right, uh, it's time. It's time to get back into things. Do we want to say any more about Windows twelve or eleven or eleven point five or Windows <laughs> Vista two point or Ventura or would you like to talk about the Surface Duo? I think the Duo, but I, you know, I'm just putting in for the new name to be Windows eleven X since we were supposed to have Windows ten X. Let's like use the eleven X name. Why not? I'm pretty sure the X is now something Microsoft will never touch again when it comes to Windows <laughs> versions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, just so going to say no next, for that. <laughs> you're just going to say no. 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 The next story um, is our opportunity to make fun of Zach. There's always opportunities for <laughs> oh, that, We but. love those. <laughs> Yay. Um, no, so Zach... Zach is like a real sleuth when it comes to this stuff. He he saw on eBay, somebody was selling a Surface Duo that didn't look exactly familiar. Um, and so he tracked it down and I'm going to let him tell you what he found because it's kind of weird and crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I found on eBay. Unfortunately, I didn't buy it. You know, not that I would. It's stolen goods, Microsoft. If you're listening, I would never have bought this. Um, but, <laughs> never um, on eBay. Oh. I came across uh, what a, a weird-looking Surface Duo Two, and the the title of the sort of listing was Surface Duo Two uh, Dev Unit. And I wasn't too sure what this was, so I asked around. By the time I was able to get a sort of concrete answer as to what this was, the the, the listing had sort of been deleted. I think it was sold to whoever bought it. Um, but yeah, this. Uh, so I had heard that this device was codenamed Kronos and was supposed to ship later this year as a lower cost version of the Surface Duo 2. Um, but it was cancelled late last year. So this thing hasn't been planned for a long time at this point. But it was. It got to a point where it existed and I guess was in self-hosters' hands or testing internally until they decided to cancel it. And it was supposed to be essentially a mid-range Surface Duo 2. It had a, a plastic exterior uh, compared to the sort of uh, glass exterior that the Surface Duo 2 has. It had one less camera on the back. It had a sort of upper mid-tier uh, Snapdragon 7 series chip, I believe. Um, and instead of the, the, it didn't have a glance bar, so the, the displays on the inside were flat rather than curved uh, down the middle. And it was essentially, you know, everything that they could pair back, they did to sort of hit a lower price bracket. Now, I unfortunately don't know what that, that price bracket was going to be. You know, a, a, a guess could be maybe 800 bucks, maybe sub a thousand, I assume is what they were trying to go for. Because if you consider the price of the Duo 2, that was 
1500 bucks at launch, I think. It was very expensive. And that was, I think, its number one criticism, right? That the Duo is just too expensive. So I guess they thought, hey, why not try and make a, a, a cheaper version? And that's what this device was going to be. Unfortunately, as far as I'm aware, it has been cancelled and they're not going to ship it. Uh, the reason I was told it was cancelled is because they decided to just go all in on the Duo 3 flagship, which, as far as I'm aware, is not coming until the end of next year. So we're, we're sort of going Duo-less for a year, unfortunately. But hopefully by the end of next year, they will have a, a product that is better than what we have currently. Who knows what they're going to do with the Duo 3. But yeah, this Qantas thing is not happening as far as I'm aware. Okay. I I I think you you know, I wanted to love the Surface Duo. <laughs> I, I did really too. Did. Yeah. Yeah. We all did. I, I know. When I got the first unit, I got one of the first test units. Like I think a hundred people got them. And I put it in my hand and I'm like, this is amazing. And then I tried to use it and mm -hmm. I was like, and it's totally unusable. Like you cannot use this. Like it's horrible. Um, the original one, software experience was terrible. There were legs, there were all kinds of problems. Camera was awful, right? Um, version two, I also finally did get a, a review unit of that. And I tried it a couple times and I just gave up because I'm like, I don't think they fixed anything. I know you like it, Zach, but... That's why we want to make fun of you. Like, why do you like this? Yeah. <laughs> well, because it, it's good. I promise. It. I'm not lying. It is good now. Yes, it, this one did launch in a little bit of a buggy state as well. But today, oh, it's yeah. in a, like, I can't f fault it. It works as it's supposed to work at this point. So, Zach, when you say good... <laughs> right. <laughs> um, right. Is it? I have know you, exactly where you're going with this. Yeah. Have you yeah. ever used a Galaxy Z Fold 3? Because uh, I used the Galaxy Z Fold One, so I'm, I was okay, there. At okay. Okay. The launch. Yeah. Of that yeah. Product. And because because obviously Microsoft has had a lot of partnerships with Samsung. They've had a lot of integrations with Windows and such yep. from uh, Galaxy phones that even the Duo didn't get first, right? Um, yep. Foldable beats dual screen, in my opinion, and I feel like for a Microsoft fan, the Z Fold Three is is the better option than than a Duo 2. And I've also still just kind of had general problems with the Duo 2, like touchscreen issues. Uh, the camera yeah. really needs work, especially in low light. It's, it's way better than Duo 1. I'll give it that because <laughs> Duo 1 didn't have a rear camera, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But but yeah, I, I feel like the Z Fold 3. So I, like to, to me, foldables is where it's at rather than dual screen. And a mid-range Duo to me doesn't, really makes sense because I feel like the product's not there yet. Like going all in on Duo 3 makes a lot more sense to me because yeah. they need this thing to mature before they explore other tiers. I fully agree. And I think Microsoft sort of thought that as well, that the product line at the time when they were developing Kronos just wasn't where it needed to be. And, you know, yeah. it, I'm not saying it's there now, but um, it, from now until the end of next year, there's a lot more time for them to improve the software and indeed put together some hardware that is above and beyond what they've done here. Um, you regarding the, the dual screen versus foldable screen debate, yeah, it, it comes down to preference, right? Um, technologically, uh -huh. I, I think a single screen foldable is better. Um, but it, it comes down to the experience of the dual screen. Like it, on the Duo, so with the Galaxy Fold 1, which is the last of the Galaxy Fold I really used, I never multitasked on it. I just never did. I had that big, mm. you know, whatever it is, 7.6 inch screen. And I just never, I never would you see me running two apps side by side in that device. And I think that's because Samsung just did a poor job at implementing multitasking on top of Android for the Galaxy Fold. You know, it's a very manual process. You have to swipe out the side draw, then you have to drag an app to the one side you want to sort of open it on and it's a process on the duo it's it's automatic you tap an app on one screen and you tap an app on the other screen and they're just running side by side it's not something you have to think about if you're in one app and you tap on a link it will just open on the other screen the galaxy fold never does stuff like that and i think that's they the did nail that between yeah, they did. They they made yeah. the multitasking seamless. Like you don't think about the fact that you're multitasking on the Duo, but you're doing it all the time. And on the Galaxy Fold, that just wasn't the case. Now, do you value multitasking on your phone? That's, you know, that's the question no. you need to ask for, for whether or not this device makes sense. <laughs> right. And, you know, for a lot of people, it doesn't. have you written on, on there? How, like, have you, have you done... <laughs> those sorts of have you done any work on that device or is it i, I have written I'm not 
not long articles, but I've certainly given it a go. I wouldn't prefer nice. to write articles on this, but you can do it if you really wanted to. Um, you know, I, I'm, no, okay, I didn't use the laptop mode, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> um, the <laughs> compose mode on this thing isn't great, and, you know, I'll be totally honest with that. But being able to sort of span one app across both screens and type with, with two screens is actually really nice. And with a big because of the screens are slightly middle. wider. Yeah, but the hinge makes you more creative. Apps. Don't you remember the... <laughs> oh, I remember. That's what Panos said. It was, it's yeah. scientifically proven. It actually adds creativity, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, see, the thing about, about spanning two... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. All right. The, but the okay. thing about spanning two different screens is that um, with certain apps, it doesn't work. Whereas yes. with a with a larger full screen, like if, if I'm reading, I mean, they have a good Kindle app, but say if I'm reading comic books on it or something, there's just a split in the middle of the page. Um, or if you're you're watching a movie on Netflix or something, there's just it's just a, it's just a split. And and if you're really looking for that multitasking experience, it can do it. But I'm not sure how popular of a use case that is compared to other things or the compromises that you make. Well, in that case, what you do is you just fold one of the screens around, and it's just a normal phone at that point, and right? The, the, the spanning capabilities. Yeah. Well, it's still a, it's, it's not a tiny screen. I, I haven't complained about this screen ever. It, it's perfectly sized. Uh, what I will say is, you know, the, the spanning capability. I, I think Microsoft advertised it wrong. Um, it's a it's a bonus. It's not a core part of the experience uh, because most apps don't support it. You're you're totally right about that. Some apps will accidentally support it sometimes, and obviously most of Microsoft's apps support it, but a lot of apps just don't. And in that case, you just wouldn't span them. You'd just use it on one screen, or you'd be using two apps side by side, or you'd fold one of the screens around and use it as a single screen phone. And yeah, I totally get the criticism of yeah, but I bought a phone with eight inches of total screen real estate i want to use all of it at once and in that case yeah this device isn't going to be for you it's for people who sort of prefer running two apps side by side or if they're not using a single screen phone because that's what being able to fold all the way around does for you and then in the rare circumstance where it works being able to span an app gives you that both screens using in one app and it looks great and it feels great but yeah it's for the most part not a phone where you would be spanning those two apps across both screens because you, you just wouldn't want to do that. I know some people say that they watch videos across both screens. I think they're insane. I've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> I The thing that surprises me the most about the Duo is that Microsoft is still backing it and still investing in it. Yeah, yeah. I think Microsoft yeah. wants to have a successful phone business um, and they're doing it right I now know. with the Duo 2. Who's to say that they won't expand in the future to other form factors running Android that also fits in your pocket? Mm -hmm. I'm, of course, hinting at maybe a single screen phone or a Galaxy Fold type device. I, I would not be surprised if they have prototypes, things like that internally. I think Microsoft genuinely wants to have a, a, a successful, I don't know how successful, or, or have a phone business of some kind because they are, they're all in on Android, right? You know, they, they their recent reorg, they created a new uh, Microsoft Android sort of group internally, yeah. which houses the, the Duo OS, it houses SwiftKey, Microsoft Launcher, all of their Android app efforts sort of under one uh, organization. And I think what they want is to do what they did with, with Windows and Surface, but with Android. They want to just have an Android device that showcases the best of all of their software on an open platform, which is Android. And hmm. how better else to do that than with phones? Because <laughs> that's what Android Partner is good at. Partner with Samsung. Partner with Samsung. Yeah. <laughs> Samsung Samsung won't set the launcher as default and have Edge as the default browser. That, that's the key thing there. I know that there are partnerships that's with true. Samsung and you have OneDrive doing backups for, I think, uh, uh, hmm. Samsung Photos hmm. and stuff. And there are some pre-installed apps from Microsoft. Um, and obviously the integration with with PhoneLink, um, but you don't get that Microsoft Launcher default sort of experience. You don't get Edge as default and all of that stuff, which I think is what Microsoft really wants at the forefront of a, of a device. And Samsung will, will I, I don't think, ever let Microsoft do that. Yeah. So 2023 then, for, you're saying October 2023, late 2023 is when... Uh, when uh, yeah, late 2023. I, I, I don't know an exact time frame yet. And obviously that could be it's pushed back. We have no idea... <laughs> Yeah, it's usually October, you're right. But we, we, you know, as of right now, I think they're targeting late 2023. Um, that could be pushed back if, you know, if the component shortage doesn't improve and they're not ready mm -hmm. to sort of ship something yet. But as of right now, they are targeting the end of next year. And um, yeah, uh, we'll, I guess we'll see what that turns out to be like. That is a little disappointing. Like, like if they're trying to compete in the phone space, like you said, uh, that they can't keep up a phone with flagship hardware like their competitors are doing. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I would. Gen one I was assume, a generation behind. 
Uh, yeah, Gen One. Yeah, Gen Two is yeah. now behind because it's almost a year old. I will say, you know, I I wouldn't be surprised if the next duo is radically different. Um, you know, they they yeah. always say, you know, they they try three times. Every every third generation of a Surface product is usually the perfected one, right? Where the, the Pro Three, mm. and I think that was the only one that actually really did that. But um, <laughs> Laptop the, Three did it. I would. It didn't. And so laptop, laptop three, three didn't look different, yeah. but but it, the weight balance was totally different. They totally redesigned yeah, they, that, that, that product was the on the inside. Inch one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. You're right. Um, yeah, the I I would not be shocked if the Duo three is, is radically different. Um, I would not even so, be surprised if they go single screen foldable for the Duo three and just have the the dual screen and nature of it be through software. So that Zach, would be let me ask you a question. Better. <laughs> let me ask you a question that's not in the show notes. What about the go Studio on. three? Oh no! What about the Studio Three? I've, I've I heard, heard a report from my been... friend Zach Bowden that, <laughs> that, that this, at this year's event we may see a Surface Studio Three. Yeah, it is October. possible. No, what, I will okay, say that yeah, they've been. <laughs> we should. What are they going to announce this year in the fall for Surface? We should like get you guys to speculate because Paul and I speculated, but we're not as close to it as you guys are. So, wait, what go on, Rich. Think what do you think's coming? <laughs> well, I know Surface Pro X and Surface Pro 9 are coming. Uh, obviously, yep. Surface Pro X with an SQ3, which is a rebranded uh, Snapdragon 8CX Gen 3. Uh, Volterra should be coming in October. Uh, they, they had said summer, but yeah. now I'm hearing that they're saving that for the uh, Surface launch event. Um, you know, Pro 9 is coming, 12th Gen Intel. Um, and then I guess uh, Surface Laptop, which... I had only heard from Zach, but makes perfect sense with 12th gen Intel and uh, Ryzen 6000, uh, which makes a lot of sense because that means like the last two years we've seen Surface Laptop in the spring, they've stayed a generation behind with Ryzen. And so now I guess they're going to catch up. And that makes a lot of sense because they're adding Thunderbolt now, which they did with Surface Pro 8 and Laptop uh, Studio finally. Uh, so now if they use Ryzen 6000, they could pair that with USB 4. So there doesn't have to be such a disparity between the Intel model and the AMD model. But Zach, yeah. what can you <laughs> so add yeah, to that? Because Zach, Zach's the surface, so, the surface expert. I don't know why he said, yeah. Rich, take that. <laughs> well, I don't want to hear what you thought first. Um, so yeah, regardless. Uh, so, of so you can tell I me mean, why I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I, honestly, I think you both got most of that right. Um, I, the Studio 3 is an interesting one because I, I heard that they wanted to ship a Studio 3 in 2020, but then the pandemic happened and I think they decided not to do that. Um, so they've been sitting on whatever it, the Studio 3 is for a little while. I would hope they've updated it since then. But as the I would last I heard, they're planning... Yeah, I don't know about a redesign, but I, I I understand that they are kind of hoping to get it out later this year. So I assume it will be announced in October alongside all these other products. Whatever's new with it, mm -hmm. I don't know. The last I heard, it had an 11th gen chip in it, which I'm hoping they've updated since because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're on 12th gen now and coming up to 13th gen. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I would hope they've updated that. But, yeah, regarding the design or any new features, I have no idea. And then the last thing I, I heard might show up this fall is Surface Earbuds 2. I don't know what's new with them, so don't ask me. But that's also apparently a contender for this fall. What about what's new with them? the Surface Monitor? Guys, <laughs> what about the Surface <laughs> Monitor? Where is that thing? Is it ever going to show up? They had confirmed that for Hub, about, right? Say it again. I was they, curious, they had what, what is the monitor Surface Hub? Monitor? Oh, I, yeah. They were supposed to use Surface technology to build a standalone monitor with no CPU unit because a lot of people oh. wanted the Surface screen. Uh, but they didn't necessarily want to have another computer. And they actually said they were going to do it, right? What, what year was that? 2019, maybe? For Studio? Um, no, I Did don't Did they confirm that for studio? for studio? For Hub. That was, for, that was the Surface Hub 2 display, yeah. right? That's right. right. Yeah, that the was Hub the 50. Because the they had the modular compute unit. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Right. So essentially what they were going to do is take out that compute unit and just sell you the screen, right. I assume. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then they, they were also did. supposed to have multiple versions. <laughs> Yeah. Right. They yeah, are. exactly. There was supposed to be the 2X, which also never came. The 2S, yeah. right. you know, if you go back and watch that initial Surface Hub 2 sort of unveiling video, that's all fake. All of the, Everything they announced in that <laughs> unveiling video never shipped. <laughs> Literally none of it. Yeah. <laughs> now, I should tell you guys a funny story because I was in the room with Zach when this happened. So they let us go oh, yeah. on an NDA <laughs> tour, right? And I can talk about it now because the NDA is over. But like they were letting us see what was going to be 
happening was the Surface Hub 2 and the 2X, right? So they had a mock-up unit, and Zach is in there, like in the group I'm in, behind the unit, trying to, like, see if the thing will come off the, <laughs> the unit and stuff. And they're like, what are you, dude, what are you doing? And he's like, can I can I just look at this? And they're like, no. <laughs> oh, my God, that's amazing. I wish I was, was there. It was hands-on. I had hands-on. That's all I was doing. Yeah, you had hands-on, all right. You had hands-on. That was when... <laughs> That was when no, was someone to, brought. He was, he was someone to, brought. Like, see the operating system version on it too. Uh, like somehow bring it up. Um, and yeah, like, but that's because it was a Windows Core yeah. thing, and they weren't talking right. about it yet. And I did ask them. Right. Right. I was like, "Is this Windows Core OS?" And they're like, "We're not talking about that." I'm like, "But it's right in yeah. front of me. What you, why? Why not?" I could. See I remember him someone. Cops in. <laughs> someone at that briefing had brought a prototype surface that no one on this call would. Uh, so no, no one, no one on this podcast would, would purchase because it's stolen property. But someone exactly. yeah. may have brought a Surface Mini to that briefing. Oh, it wasn't me. I wonder that's who what you're, you're talking. No, about. definitely wasn't Zach. Is what we're saying. Oh. Oh. Microsoft, I don't have it anymore. So please don't call me. Thank you. <laughs> See what we do in the name of journalism, people. This is our job. Yes. <laughs> got to do what you got to do. You do. Uh, anything, so I guess one uh, more thing regarding yeah, yeah one more thing regarding the, the the fall event I guess is the the other thing that I heard might be happening and I don't know if this is for a fact yet is they may merge the Pro X and the oh. Pro Nine I guess I don't know what they're going to call it under one brand and just have it Surface Pro Nine or Surface Pro Ten who knows what yeah. they'll call it but instead of having a, a a separate Pro X model for the ARM variant it will just have it under the normal one and then when you configure it in the store it will be mm. through Intel or you choose the SQ3 I guess whatever they call it um, I don't know if that's actually going to happen but that's something I heard may be on the cards and that would be really interesting if they do that because it would be a big a moment for Windows and ARM where Microsoft is essentially going, this is no longer special. This is just, yeah. <laughs> this is no, Windows and ARM is no longer special. This is just part of the Surface Pro line and yeah. you can configure it with ARM or I, configure it with Intel. I, I don't think that's happening this year though. Um, I think it might uh, well, be next it year. It might not be this year, but I just um, heard, I heard it was something they were thinking about. Yeah. Also, I, I think I, I, have, I have a theory on, on why though, because, because, I do think that Panos can't like because I mentioned uh, Ryzen six thousand and Intel twelfth gen and USB four and Thunderbolt and the the new Surface Pro X I believe will still be USB three point two while the Pro nine is still is going to have Thunderbolt and I think I do think they right. care about that kind of disparity between the product and just trying to say this yeah. thing is the same but not. Yeah. Well, I guess it's probably fair to say that it's a goal for them to merge them because they they would right. like to. I think it's happening next year. Just. An addition, rather than rather than a special thing that has to be treated differently because yeah. it's it's worse or different in in many different ways. And you know, we've seen lots of focus on Windows and ARM recently as well. You know, Build was mm -hmm. a big a big event for Windows and ARM. They were now you know the whole the, the developer yeah. tool yeah. chain is now ARM native. Yeah. Project Volterra, which sort of Full came out of nowhere. Studio. That's a, Full Visual Studio, exactly. And then Volterra, yeah. which was, is a sort of Mac mini, but for Windows running ARM and stuff. You know, all of that sort of appeared out of nowhere, and it was was a sudden push forward for Windows and ARM. And I think this is in preparation, of course, for the Nuvia stuff, which is supposed mm -hmm. to be launching towards the end of next year, right? And I guess we won't see that in, in a Surface Pro X until 2024. Or hopefully you'd see it at the end of next year, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. All right, let's get, that's a great segue to get Rich to speculate on the Qualcomm <laughs> Tech Summit. It's Qualcomm okay. Tech Summit coming in Hawaii in November. I bet you're going in person, are you? I am I am going in person, of course. Of course. <laughs> um, so so um, I can speculate of what, what what we'll see at Snapdragon Summit this year. I, th I think we we could see as many as four new Windows on ARM chipsets because uh, really? right now we have the seven C, eight C, and eight CX. Um, that's that's the existing lineup from Qualcomm. Seven uh, C is very is very popular at the low end. It's in some budget Windows. Laptops. And it's also in a bunch of Chromebooks, so uh, that is a high priority for Qualcomm. Uh, we might see 8CX Gen 4. Um, 8C hasn't been refreshed since the beginning. It's been in very few products, but I understand that it's not done. Like, they're not killing it. So that that's going to be refreshed at some point, whether that's this year or not. And then 8CX Gen 4 would be a successor to, you know, Gen 3. Mm -hmm. And then we might see Nuvia. Because because the, the Nuvia chip, uh, like obviously for for those that don't know, Qual Qualcomm bought this company called Nuvia, and it's supposed to help them 
uh, build their own custom ARM chips, sort of like what Apple is doing. And right now they're using ARM designs and what they would be able to do is just use the ARM instruction set. So rather than having to wait for ARM to put out new designs and build new processors based on those, they would have the full stack of processor development uh, like Intel and Apple do already. Uh, so that's been sampling to OEMs uh, starting second half of this year. So the second half just started, should be sampling to OEMs soon. They could announce that chip at Snapdragon Summit. I don't know what it will be called. I don't think it's going to be 8CX. Maybe 9CX? <laughs> yeah, so Qualcomm has made a really big... 12. 12, yeah. <laughs> Qualcomm has made a really big deal about saying that 8 is their top-of-the-line product. 8 means premium. That's why they had the 888, and now it's just 8 Gen 1 for mobile. Um, for PC, uh, it's 8C. C means compute, and then 8CX, X means extreme. Um, but... From what I, I believe that HCX Gen 4 and the Nubia chip will uh, exist in parallel to each other. And it's not like it's not like the Nubia chip is just going to be the next HCX. I think I think it's going to be a new a new is, line of chips from them. Is, is that because the, the 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 Nubia chips are predicted to be quite expensive, probably more so than the Gen 4 chips? Mm. No, I think it's just another tier. I think like um, like they've always said that HCX was an i5 competitor. And I think right. in the beginning it was like a seventh gen i5 that they were comparing it to, and now they probably compare it to like an eleventh gen or something. Um, so this would be more along the lines of like 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 an i7 or an i9 competitor, and um, hopefully, like I I don't know if they're aiming for the MacBook Pro comp like like an M1 Pro or an M1 Max just yet. But I, I know that's definitely where they want to go at some point. And this, the Nubia chip is, is supposed to take them there. Do we think that, assuming that these Nubia chips can match Apple, do we think Microsoft will start putting them in more surfaces? Because right now it is literally only the Pro X that has an ARM chip. Every other Surface, as far as I'm aware, it, apart, other than the Duo, every other Surface PC is Intel or AMD. Um, could we see Microsoft put a, a Nubia chip in the Surface laptop or... A, um, a Surface Go, or maybe not Nubia chip in the Surface Go, but um, do you think maybe ARM will expand throughout the Surface line more as we sort of get better and better chips that can compete with what Apple is doing in the, on the M1 or M2, M3 um, side of things? It totally could happen. I, any of this stuff could happen eventually, right? Because because I, I look at, I, anytime I look at the, the market when it comes to ARM, ARM is winning and Apple's doing great with their with their hardware and it's not just it's not just the performance because in a lot of use cases intel totally matches if not exceeds the performance that apple's uh, offering but the fact that they could put something like an m1 ultra in a product that's you know like eight inches square and then like five inches tall or something that's crazy um where we on windows with an intel chip we would need a you know a, like a 125 watt cpu and a, and a giant graphics card to to do something like that. Um, Intel plans on uh, winning, be, being in the lead in performance for Watt by 2025, or at least that's what they're promising right now. So if they can do that, that's that's kind of the question. But but if they can't, if they can't somehow catch up to, to what's being done on the ARM side, absolutely this stuff is going to show up in more products. Yeah. You know, I think we have to thank Apple for, for making really great chips that everybody yeah. wants to be. Because yeah. every all of these companies are now striving to beat it, and as a result, we're going to get better Windows PCs as a result. So thanks, Apple. By the way, yeah. By the way, um, Qualcomm was the was the first to thank Apple for, for this. They, yeah, you know when, when they announced when they announced their own silicon for Max, Qualcomm came right out there and like this. We think this is great because it's going to push more developers to develop for ARM, and it, and it legitimizes, you know, ARM PCs, and it's great for everyone. Yeah. Well, I love the competition. That yeah, well, Rich is the one for people who remember this um, from a, I guess a year ago um, that he reported that Qualcomm and Microsoft had an exclusive yes. deal, and that this may have something to do with the fact that Microsoft still won't officially support Windows on Apple mm -hmm. Silicon, right? Um, that deal is supposed to be ending, right? Unless there's been an extension to it, and 
What do you know, so, Rich? Know anything? So, good? so here's the thing. I, 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 I don't. I don't have an update on on when that deal is is ending. Uh, but at the right. time, well, I, you're going my, to Hawaii I, for a reason, right? Like, so this is your well, time <laughs> Yeah, but that's the thing. I'm not, uh, Qualcomm's not gonna. The, the thing is, Microsoft and Qualcomm officially won't acknowledge that this that this deal no, exists. They won't. Right. Um, but there there are there are now other companies like MediaTek that that have said that they will make a Windows on ARM chip once they are allowed to. So I would keep my eye more on MediaTek Summit, which is the mm. week before Qualcomm's event in November. That's going to be held in California. Mm. And I'll be there as well. <laughs> of course you will. <laughs> Mr. No. Chips, we, he'll be do, there. Do we know why this exclusivity deal even exists? Like, what, 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 Where is the benefit for the ecosystem? Because unless, you know, it, does MediaTek have chips that would benefit Windows PCs or is it really only Qualcomm? And are we not missing out? With this exclusive, no, but, no we're, we're, we're not we're, we're not missing out right now. So, like I said, the, the way that Qualcomm develops their chips, it's just ARM. A, a, ARM announces um, an architecture. They, they 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 announce, you know, the chips that Qualcomm is going to use. Like they show this stuff off a year ahead of time, and then Qualcomm announces the actual chip that uses the cores that that ARM announced. So so MediaTek could just make the same chip essentially. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. The, the, the reason that the exclusivity deal is in place, um, I mean, it's pretty straightforward because because there, there was nothing to gain for Qualcomm in, in, in supporting yeah. PCs to begin with back in 2016 yeah, cool. when they announced this. And when they said, all right, we're going to work on this together, they said, what do we get? And uh, they said, all right, so for X amount of years, you're going to be the only one that makes makes ARM chips for, for Windows PCs. Um I, I, I think the first we'll hear about it ending w- will be from MediaTek. Microsoft will probably never announce that there was a that there actually right. was a deal. But then, but I, I would expect that that once that happens, you know, we'll see we'll see Windows on ARM open up to MacBooks, and then hopefully Apple would support Boot Camp, which would be awesome. But like once you realize there's an exclusivity deal, all the other, all the limitations around Windows on ARM suddenly make sense. Hmm. There didn't Microsoft say it build that. Sometime this summer, they would have more to say about licensing Windows on Apple Silicon. I think they actually said that publicly, right? Did they? Yeah. I I, that, somebody, but- I forget who sent us the link. It might have been Taro, our friend Taro Alhonen, um, who found it. Hmm. But somebody said that at Build. Like, this summer, we're going to have more to say. Okay, so we're running out of summer. Let's see when we're going to say it. <laughs> hmm. I mean, so so what is the, other than the fact that it's not allowed by Microsoft, are there any technical limitations for running Windows and ARM on a Mac right now? Like, so there's no boot camp, so I guess no. you're running it through VMware, I guess is how people right. are doing there's it, no right? ISO, right? There's no ISO, right? There's no ISO for the thing, right? Yeah, so, so no, what, what are people using to install on Parallels? Well, well, they have, they have a, a VHDX file that you can use to make a VM. Oh, right. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and then I guess it's just not allowed on a Mac, but it's fine on, on, on legitimate Windows and RPCs. <laughs> yeah, it's right. not supported. Yeah. That's the key, right? Like, so right. people can do it, but if you're a business and if anything goes wrong, you're out of luck. Like Microsoft will just say, yeah, we're not, we didn't say you could do that. Yeah. So, <laughs> And even, even those VHDX files were originally made uh, when they were releasing Hyper-V for Windows on ARM PCs. So they're supposed to be run on Qualcomm PCs too. So... I don't know. That's it. There's nothing technically keeping Windows on ARM from running on. I, I think some people have gotten in the early days of M1. People got Windows on ARM to run natively on on some MacBooks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, have fun in Hawaii and let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we take another quick break? Sure. And now it's time to tell you about this week's sponsor of Windows Weekly. It's ClickUp. So imagine this, having one extra day every week, one extra day, more time to cook healthy meals, to work on that novel you might be working on, maybe to binge some good TV. Uh, When I think about what I would do with an extra day each week, it would probably be sleep for that whole day, which would be very nice. Uh, It's all possible with ClickUp, the productivity platform that's going to save you one day a week on work, guaranteed. 
ClickUp began with the premise that productivity was broken. There were too many tools to keep track of, too many things in entirely separate ecosystems. There had to be a more productive way to get through the daily hustle. ClickUp is the one tool to house all your tasks, your projects, your docs, your goals, your spreadsheets, and everything else that you're working on. ClickUp is built for teams from one to 1,000 or more. It's packed with features and customization options that no other productivity tool has, so you can work the way you work best. Whether you're in project management, engineering, sales, marketing, HR, ClickUp has easy-to-use solutions that create a more efficient work environment. Join the more than 800,000 highly productive teams using ClickUp today. Use the code WINDOWS to get 15% off ClickUp's massive unlimited plan for a year, meaning you can start reclaiming your time for under 5 bucks a month. Sign up today at ClickUp.com and use that code WINDOWS. And do hurry, because that offer ends very soon. ClickUp.com and use the offer code WINDOWS. Thank you so much to ClickUp for sponsoring this week's episode of Windows Weekly. All right, Mary Jo, what's next on the list? Yeah, so I'm excited we get to dig in a little more about the Microsoft Netflix partnership that was announced. It was announced during Windows Weekly last week, and we didn't really have a chance to look into it that deeply at that point. But um, I'm dying to hear what, what Zach and Rich think about where this could go in the future. So first, let me give you a quick outline of what it's about. So Netflix has been known to be developing a an ad-supported, less expensive streaming service. Um, they've publicly said that they plan to do that. They announced last week that they've chosen Microsoft to be their exclusive ad support ad partner for this partnership. So that means Bing and MSN and all those things we lament uh, on the show regularly will be part of this <laughs> subscription. <laughs> um, Microsoft acquired a company um, at the end of 2021 from AT&T called Xander, X-A-N-D-R. And that gives them a lot of uh, play around connected TV and the whole tech platform for premium advertising for TV. And supposedly this is going to be a big piece of what they do with Netflix. Okay, so we knew that uh, right, like, like around last Thursday. Then... There was an analyst, I forget, I forget who this was, but a, a, a security analyst who came out and said, well, you know what's really going on here. This is just Microsoft setting itself up to buy Netflix. Um, and Netflix <laughs> is, is going to out, be out there shopping itself around and Microsoft's just sitting there waiting. And it's a great fit because Microsoft's all into subscription services. And yeah, why not buy Netflix, right? Makes sense. When I heard this, I'm like, makes yeah. sense. This makes no sense. Like, like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, how, how what? <laughs> like Microsoft buying Netflix? And then I thought to myself, oh, wait, this is the company that almost bought TikTok. And way back when, mm -hmm. they almost bought Yahoo, right? So something doesn't have to make sense for Microsoft to do it. It can <laughs> still happen, even if it makes no sense. <laughs> um, so what do you guys think? In fact, think? it's it, even does, more likely to happen if it doesn't make sense. <laughs> it kind of is, right? So what do you guys think? Um, is there any way this would make sense? You know, I think Jez over on um, Windows Central made a case. Well, it fits in with what they're doing with gaming, right? And I was so going to say game streaming a, tech, I think, is the only. Right. Because uh, right. like, because Netflix is really good at streaming at scale, right? Yeah. Uh, so so maybe if they have some kind of streaming tech that could help with uh, game streaming. Because, I mean, it's not about uh, entertainment streaming, like movies and TV. I mean. Movies and TV is clearly not a priority for Microsoft in any no. meaningful no. way. Like there, there, <laughs> there have been <laughs> leaks and rumors of an Xbox dongle and stuff, but even that's about gaming. Yeah. Um, but the movies and TV, like that's not even cross-platform. So it's definitely not about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, all I can see is is game streaming tech if they have it. I, uh, Zach, what do you what what do you think? Does it make sense? I'm not. Yeah, I I don't know, but isn't Netflix like? struggling a little bit right now I, I've, I've seen headlines yeah. where they're losing subscribers <laughs> and I don't know if yeah. they're making money still or, or what, what the situation is but they're not in a great place where they have versus you know a year or two ago uh, would it make sense for Microsoft to buy a company that's seemingly struggling keep in mind this is a, a, um, an industry a market that is very competitive you know we've got Amazon we've got um, Hulu we've got 
Apple, loads of big companies are here, but, you know, doing these streaming services. And not only do they just have to stream content, they have to make their own original content as well. Is Microsoft willing to get into that game where they have to now start making TV shows and movies like Apple does? You know, mm -hmm. some of the Apple, I, I have Apple TV and Apple makes some great shows. And can Microsoft compete in that market? Do they even want to compete in that market right. is, is another question entirely. Because this is a very consumer focused market. And as we all know, Microsoft tries not to dabble in consumer markets as much as it can, or in a lot of areas at least, uh, other than Xbox. So yeah, the only angle I would say makes sense is for Xbox, but does Xbox want to dive back into to movies and TV? Because if you remember, they tried that mm. with the Xbox One and it failed spectacularly. Gamers rejected it. You know, I don't think any TV show other than Halo got off the ground and that took almost a decade. <laughs> so um, I, I, I just don't think Microsoft wants to get into the, the home entertainment sort of TV slash movies market because it's very competitive. Yeah. Do you remember when Xbox was going to be the, the, the brand for all things entertainment? Yeah. When we had Xbox yeah. video yeah. and Xbox music. Mm -hmm. And obviously all those things are gone now. Um, the, the, I mean, they, they could, if they really wanted to get into making TV shows, like there's nothing, like, there's nothing stopping them that like they, they do it with games, but I don't think there's any world where, where it makes sense to do. Yeah. I don't think they'll ever use the Xbox brand for that again, because I think Xbox yeah. suffered significantly when they tried to make Xbox an all encompassing thing Oh yeah, and their core audience, that being gamers just simply rejected it, which is why the Xbox one did so poorly and is why Microsoft to this day are still sort of fighting, you know, Sony still took over the PlayStation and, yeah, they're still recovering because of that focus. That they lost focus. You know, gaming was just a part of a bigger vision, and it all fell apart for them. So I, I would be shocked if Xbox went, "Let's do movies and TV again." Because the last <laughs> time they tried that, it didn't go well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, I, I saw people saying yeah, it's just it's just a short hop from like having studios that create games to having studios that create TV shows. I'm like, no, I don't think that's a short hop. I don't know because I'm not in that field, but it seems pretty different to me, mm. like a different skill set, a different group of people who would right. be undertaking that. And sure, they could farm that out, right? They could just say, okay, we'll, we'll have our own exclusive content, but we'll hire, uh, uh, you know, TV studios to do it and we'll work with them as partners. They could do that, but I don't know. I, I really know, I know they want to look more and more consumer friendly and have products and services that attract consumers and not just businesses. But this to me just feels like, Ooh, that could be such a big money pit if they decide to do this. Yeah. Especially since Netflix is apparently not doing too well. Like what, what right. can Microsoft bring to the table to right the ship and bring them back on track? Can they <laughs> yeah. bring anything? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I, yeah, you know, maybe no. somebody on the Xbox team might have an idea or two, but I don't think Microsoft's the company to buy Netflix if they need to be bought. <laughs> yeah. No, I think this is just about ads. I think that's it. Mm. Yep. Yeah. And like, right, what would Microsoft gain buying them? Are they still going to make money through this partnership? I, I assume they right. will. Otherwise, why would they agree to the partnership? Um, so yeah. they don't get the baggage and they still get to make money. And I think that's probably mm -hmm. the best for Microsoft. Yep. Agree. All right. We did. We took care of that analyst who said that. She was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Our work is done here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, we didn't talk yet about the big thing that happened this week, which is Microsoft's annual partner show, oh, Inspire. There was a Microsoft show? There was. Yeah, say, it was virtual. <laughs> it was virtual, sadly. So, yeah. Were there any announcements? <laughs> were there? There were. Yeah. There were. A few, a few that you guys maybe even wrote about or heard about at least. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, it's funny. They, they still haven't really talked a whole lot about what they're doing with Fluid and, um, you know, how they're, they're working on an app to compete with Notion called Fluid. Um, they showed this like over a year ago and they haven't really said anything since. But what they are doing is talking about how some of the existing office apps inside Teams are using Fluid Framework technology to finally actually do real-time collaboration. So they announced this thing called Excel Live at Inspire this week. And Excel Live is 
going to be super exciting to people who care about Excel. Um, you, we know you are among our listeners on Windows Weekly because mm-hmm. we hear from you. Yeah. <laughs> um, these are, the, the Excel Live is going to let people who are working together in teams work simultaneously on Excel notebooks. So right now, like Microsoft has real-time authoring collaborations sort of in these Office apps. As Paul and I know from OneNote, it doesn't always work the best. That's why we moved to Notion. Um, but... Excel Live is going to let people, like say you have a Teams chat and there's a bunch of people talking about an Excel spreadsheet or an Excel Excel notebook. They can all work on it together at the same time. So people who are into Excel are like, this is going to be amazing. This was the missing piece of Excel. And I think this is going to be astounding. So yeah, that's one of the announcements. That was a pretty good one. Most confusing announcement award goes to Viva and Gage. Um, so Viva <laughs> is Microsoft's employee experience platform. You know, they have Viva Topics, Viva Learn, Viva Insights, there are all these modules. And it's basically been a platform to help you onboard new employees as, in, as a company. Like when someone joins your company, either virtually or in person, you can kind of set them up on Viva and say, here's all the things you need to learn about our company and communications coming to you from corporate you have Viva Goals. You have all these modules that are meant to help you succeed as an employee. So I still week, hold that Viva is really cool. I th- I think yeah, that was a. You I remember, liked it. I remember yeah. you really were into Viva. Yeah. Yeah. So this week they announced a thing called Viva Engage, which is based on Yammer, um, which is a social media platform that Microsoft owns. So if you go back and you look at the headlines that came out about this this week, a lot of people had never seen Yammer before. And when they saw Viva Engage, they saw Facebook. Like they're like, oh, Microsoft's oh. ripping off Facebook, right? Like, yes, I saw Microsoft, these headlines. They're copying Facebook. It's like, no, guys, they have a product called Yammer. They do these things called yam jams, not even making that up. That's a real thing they talk about at Microsoft. Um, I just imagine and, someone yeah, holding they, up a so jar this builds of on top like, of Yammer, and it's yam. meant to let people use things like storylines, stories, this new video clip technology that, that lets you make short videos and embed them in posts so that you can talk to your colleagues and exchange information and get to know them. Okay. Using clip chat. The reason this was so confusing is. Microsoft already has this app. It's called um, Teams, uh, commu- Teams Communities or Communities Teams, Teams Communities. And so what they're doing is they're rebranding Teams Communities as Engage. Um, and they're going to use that technology inside Viva. But at the same time, they're keeping Yammer around. They're not killing the brand. So the official Microsoft term for this is hybrid branding. I'm also not making that up. It means you are... <laughs> giving a product a new name, but you're not killing the old name completely so that you're having both these things go on at the same time. It's hybrid, like cool, hybrid, right? (laughs) Yay. That's so Um, confusing. (laughs) Yeah, the write-ups of this were pretty all over the map. Um, And I think think Microsoft has a lot more explaining to do on this and and has to clarify a lot of things about this for people to get it. one more announcement from from uh, Inspire that you guys may or may not care about, but en- Enterprise will care about this. So Microsoft is creating a digital contact center. And the way they're doing this is they're taking a bunch of products they already have and mushing them together. That's the official term, mushing them together. <laughs> they're taking <laughs> Teams, Dynamics 365, Power Platform, and then Nuance. You know, they just bought this company called Nuance um, for $19.7 billion. Nuance is mostly a healthcare company, but they have a lot of AI technology too. And they have their own contact center at Nuance. So Microsoft is taking all these different piece parts. They're uh, bringing them together and creating a contact center. So this is for people, you know, in sales who have to talk to people all day on their headsets. You know, they need to track information about their clients, see where the opportunities are, know things like, when was the last time I called this person? So this unified contact center will do all of this for you. So they, they're they actually going to start selling this kind of as a disparate, disparate pieces loosely joined and over time kind of make it more of a true unified offering. How does Nuance That's play you. into it? So Nuance has um, AI technology that is going to be part of this. It does things like sentiment analysis. So when you're talking to somebody on the phone mm -hmm. and they sound really mad, it'll be like, yeah, the person you're talking to isn't really liking the pitch you're making right now. Maybe you want to switch that up a little. Yeah. Um, So that's that's one of the things it does. Um, They call Nuance's AI technology is secure AI AI AI-infused contact center 
technology. That's a mouthful, but yeah, that's that's one of the things they have and what they do. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of other um, announcements at the partner show. Every year there's like lots of new partner programs. Um, I'm going to talk in my pick of, uh, pick of the week a little bit more about one other thing, um, and I'll talk a bit more about where they're going, the vertical stuff at Microsoft. But yeah, that's, that's in a nutshell. If I was going to tell you what was cool at Inspire, those are the three main things I would say. But there was some non-Inspire news too that these guys wanted me to make sure we talked about having to do with Discord and Xbox. <laughs> I was trying to avoid talking about Xbox on the show today, but I guess we're not going to be able to totally avoid it. So either of you so can Mary take jo, it away. So Mary Jo, you and I can sit back while they talk about we it. We can. <laughs> We can. <sighs> this isn't really a huge announcement, but uh, the, today, I think it was earlier today, that uh, Xbox and Discord announced Discord voice chat integration directly on Xbox. So now if you have a Discord account, you can link that up to your Xbox and chat with people on Discord using your Xbox headset plugged into an Xbox in your living room. And that's a huge thing I think lots of gamers have been asking for for a long time. And it is interesting because wasn't Microsoft rumored to be in talks to buy Discord at one yes. point? That obviously fell through yep. and never oh, yes. happened. Um, <laughs> but I wonder if this was sort of always planned or if this sort of came to be after that conversation happened. And although it fell through, maybe they were like, hey, let's keep in contact. And now this is what's happened. Who knows? Um, but yeah, the Xbox and Discord are now integrated and in, uh, that users of each platform can chat with each other, which is a big deal in the gaming. Yeah world. I was going to say, I know I joked about sitting back, but this is huge on so many levels because one, of course, yes, I know lots of friends of mine who are gamers uh, use Discord all the time, but this gives you the ability to not have to be part of that horrible, horrible experience that is Xbox Live Chat with horrible people who say horrible things. And instead, mm -hmm. you can just communicate with your community that you've set up on Discord. Yeah. I think that's incredible. Right. Yeah, it's great. And um, I, I think it's only for voice right now, so there's no chat, which makes sense. You, uh, very few people are chatting with text on an Xbox. Um, <laughs> but yeah, voice chat, which was the, was the big thing, is finally coming and will be integrated into the Xbox guide and stuff. So I don't think it requires a dedicated app on Xbox. Uh, it's all integrated, so the experience should be seamless. And uh, that's really nice to see. That is a smart move, actually, uh, on all of their parts. I know Paul regularly talks about how... Um, there's all this talk about trying to deal with the toxicity of Xbox gaming and uh, everything that is going on there and the abuse and whatnot. And he has, you know, regularly said that they don't ever really do much in that way. And I think this is one way where that can be addressed is if you can, you know, still have the fun of being able to communicate with folks, but in a way where you are more in charge of, of who is, is mm -hmm. there and who's talking to you and who you talk to. I think that's a really smart move on Xbox's part. And of course, it's a great move for Discord that, I mean, you yeah. see people creating new communities all the time on Discord. Um, all right. Well, before we get to tips and picks, I think we'll take another break and uh, then we'll return for the back of the book and everything there. I want to tell you about Infrascale. We're bringing you this episode of Windows Weekly. See, the statistics for ransomware attacks are quite alarming when you dig into them. Cyber criminals can penetrate up to 93% of company networks, according to a report from betanews.com. And it's not just large organizations. 46% of SMBs have been victims of ransomware attacks as well. The Infrascale cloud backup solution is here to help. It'll provide the security you need to manage backups and secures them from hackers or adverse events. You can back up and protect your endpoint data and never pay a ransom, which means you'll sleep easier at night. You can back up SaaS applications, endpoints, servers, as well as execute disaster recovery on site or in the cloud. Every company needs a secure, simple to configure, and easy to manage endpoint data protection solution. Infrascale integrates with Hyper-V and VMware. It enables site-to-site -site failover with orchestration in the Infrascale cloud. And this is a way for you to keep the hackers at bay. Immutability is at the core of how the product is designed, so your data is encrypted in the storage, so no one can alter it. 
Infrascale Backup and Disaster Recovery uh, is there to help when a server crashes or if you experience a human error, malicious activity, natural disaster. A localized or site-wide incident means unanticipated costs or unplanned downtime. Both come with a price. According to Gartner, this is quite the statistic. The average cost of downtime across all industry sectors is $5,600 per minute. That's about $300,000 per hour. Clients and partners alike, including MSPs and VARs, trust Infrascale backup and recovery solutions to eliminate downtime and data loss with the most cost-effective enterprise-grade data protection solutions to help keep their businesses running. If disaster strikes, your applications, your data, and your systems are recovered and available in record time. The award-winning world-class support is also there to ensure your business is protected 24-7, now with SSD at no extra charge. Infrascale has a solution for your data protection needs. Whatever your data, whatever your environment, Infrascale provides continuity and resiliency for your business. Visit infrascale.com slash twit to get the free ebook five essential components of a ransomware protection plan and learn how to protect your business today. That's infrascale, I-N-F-R-A, scale.com slash twit. Thanks so much to Infrascale for sponsoring this week's episode of Windows Weekly. And now we are nearing the end of the show. Mary Jo, take it away. Yeah, I, d- I don't know if you wanted to ask for any listener, live listener questions. Oh, no? we could do that. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Um, I, we got people on, you know, Twitter who are listening in and we got people on the Discord and uh, chat. I think IRC chat, you guys have people. So we do. Yes. If you've got if, questions for the, I know. the you've guests. Got two of the, you got two of the best <laughs> Windows watchers and Microsoft watchers on the show today. Zach and Rich. So take advantage of this. Chip questions. Give them some hard questions. I have one for Zach, actually, if I can start Ooh, out. Please go start. ahead. <laughs> All right. Tell us what happened with the Neo. Like Surface Neo, right? Like that we saw we saw the Surface Neo dual screen Windows device. It was supposed to run 10X, but okay, why can't they just still do a Surface Neo? type device, dual screen laptop or dual screen portable kind of thing with either running Windows or running Android. Why not? Like, can't they do this? Uh, So the Neo that was announced from a hardware perspective kind of was flawed uh, as far as I'm aware. Um, Also, it was just sort of hit with blow after blow after it was announced. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, 10X was was cancelled along the way and this Mm -hmm. device was built with 10X in mind. Not that they couldn't put Windows 11 on it if they really wanted to, um, but then Intel cancelled the chip it was supposed to ship with, which I think was an Intel Lakefield chip or some kind, the same chip in the uh, Lenovo X1 Fold, I believe. Um, and as far as I'm aware, you know, I, I have spoken to a number of people who were testing the hardware or new people who was testing the hardware. And one of the, the, one of the things I consistently heard was the device just ran hot and throttled a lot. It was super thin it, 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 and didn't have a fan in it. And the Intel chip they were using was not very efficient. So it was just not a great experience. That paired with... Uh, Windows 10X just not being ready and the emulation or the virtualization tech they were using being quite um, heavy on the device meant things like Teams didn't work very well on it. And Teams is obviously a vital application for lots of Microsoft employees. And those self-hosting the hardware just weren't able to sort of use Teams on it properly. There were a lot of issues with it. So um, if, if they were to ever announce the Neo or ship the Neo again, I think it would be a radically different device. Um, the other thing is I just... I think maybe they've realized that dual screen PCs just aren't going to happen in that way. <laughs> I think that's um, it. I I th- not, it's, it th- yeah. They're not doing dual screen PCs. Like, cause, yeah. cause they're yeah. not, when they, when they killed 10 X, uh, they, they were talking about adding some of those features to windows 11, or maybe it was rumored that they were going to add some of those features to windows 11, but, uh, they, they didn't, they are not like, like Intel, yeah. uh, Intel has announced an Evo spec for foldables. Um, and, OEMs still have to make their own custom software for that to be a good experience. Microsoft is not putting that kind of development into Windows 11. Yeah. Uh, last I heard. Yeah. So, so um, also, I mean, that, that Lakefield chip was, it was almost like a prototype chip at the time. Mm-hmm. It was like, like a, a proof of concept that like it had, had the new hybrid architecture and they were putting it out there for these specialized types of PCs. And I think it was always going to be replaced by 12th gen where the entire lineup has that hybrid architecture. Like you could make something new with, with like a, with like a 12th gen U9 processor, which is a nine watt 
uh, hybrid chip, uh, like a next generation of, of that of that Lakefield chip, or you could use an ARM chip, which you know, like we talked about before, there's going to be some uh, like like Gen three is a lot more powerful, and they'll have something even more powerful later on this year. So, mm, yeah. I, I mean, the, like the hardware could 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 happen. It's just that Microsoft isn't focusing on the software right now, and if they're not focusing on the software, then they're, they're just not doing the hardware. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's because they've just decided that dual screens just isn't going to happen in the Windows space. Um, I don't think yeah. there's any OEMs lining up <laughs> to, to ship dual screen mm-hmm. devices. So I, I think the next big thing for the Windows PC space will be foldable, single screen foldable. And it wouldn't shock me if Microsoft sort of, if they were to revive the Neo, revive it as a single screen foldable because... Um, you know, later, I think Intel announced that a wave of foldable PCs are coming. And um, I think Asus yeah, is already they, announced theirs. I think Lenovo's teasing theirs. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lenovo's teasing theirs. And I wouldn't be surprised if Dell and HP have stuff up their sleeves as well. And, you know, if they've got it, if they're working on their stuff, then surely Microsoft is also. Mm. Mm-hmm. There's a good question uh, I saw earlier on. Um, does the new schedule for updates, this idea that there are going to be more moments that take place, uh, mean that maybe seekers won't have to use the beta, what is it called? The beta circle, the beta ring. What is it now these days? Mm. <laughs> uh, and instead can get fun new stuff all the time. Is this a way to kind of uh, give people the opportunity to seek out new things without having to be in those uh, other tracks or rings? Well, the features will still be tested in the dev and beta channels before they're deemed ready to roll out, of course. I don't think Microsoft is just going to drop new features to, like, to the production you know, version of Windows without any testing. Uh, so if right. you wanted access to features earlier, then the Insider program will probably still be the way to go about that. But yeah, for, for end users, they will be getting new features more frequently. Um, but they will still have gone through testing first. They're not just going to roll those features out to everybody without testing them. Uh, and then uh, Robo in the chat says, as an Android user, what I want is updates and support. How likely is Microsoft mm-hmm. to support the Duo and for how long? The original Duo? Didn't they... Pu- <laughs> the original Duo. They, so they said that the original Duo was going to be supported for three years. Uh, three years of major updates. I'm not too sure if they said anything longer for security updates. Uh, the Duo 1 so far has had one major feature update technically. I think it was probably destined for Android 13 before things are thrown into question. Whereas uh, the Duo 2, I guess, is one year newer, so Android 14. So yeah, there's a long way to go for for the Duo 2 at least in regards to updates. Um, but the Duo 1 is, I would say, maybe halfway through its life support life cycle at this point, maybe a bit more. Do you think that they'll, um, do you think they'll stick to that three-year uh, that three-year life cycle when they when they seem to run about a year behind on these updates? Yeah. Um, when the Duo 1 first launched, I had heard that Microsoft was had to or will have to pay Qualcomm for the addition, for the extra year because they are a year behind uh, for continued updates on Android. Um, so they have committed to that, I believe. So, um, yeah. Okay. And then Mary Jo, there was a question. Um, yep. For Windows you. 7. Yes, a Windows 7 question. So last week there were some rumors based, I think, uh, based on code that somebody found in one of the beta builds uh, of Windows that suggested that Microsoft might be extending the um, possibility of buying support contracts for Windows 7 past January 2023. So they had they had a three-year extension where each year beyond when uh, support ended, you could pay to continue to get security updates for Windows 7. It was super expensive, like something only enterprises would do. And you had to d- uh, jump through all these hoops to get the extended, su- extended support. So uh, there was a rumor that Microsoft might be extending it past January 2023 if people were willing to pay for it. And so this week, I finally got an answer from Microsoft and they said, nope, we are not extending it past 2023. 20- January 2023, that's the end of it for Windows 7. No more security updates. So that's the official answer on that. Well, there you heard it. It's coming to an end for real this time. We promise. We're serious. (laughs) Stop making that face. I'm telling you the truth. (laughs) Uh, And then someone asks, Microsoft has the SQ series SOCs for the Surface 10. Mm -hmm. Is there any indication they would have a custom branded SOC for Surface Duo and future mobile devices? No, 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 no I'll, I'll tell you why. Here's the thing. Here's, um, 
A custom branded is is what that is, right? And just because also in Surface Laptop, they have the AMD Ryzen Surface Edition chips, which are maybe a little bit tweaked, but they are very much just rebranded processors. The SQ1 was a Snapdragon 8 CX. Uh, I think it had a slightly higher clock speed, but but that is it. They are not custom processors. Um, and Microsoft kind of does this in a way to, I, I guess, make the processors look better so they use AMD and Qualcomm because they're lesser partners than Intel. Um, on the phone side of things, Qualcomm is the power player like Intel is on PCs. So I don't think you'll ever see any kind of custom uh, Qualcomm chip to, that goes in a Surface Duo. There you go. All right. I think that's the end of the Q&A. Uh, if you're ready to move on to the back of the book, Mary Jo. We are. And we've got some picks and tips from our guests today. Awesome. Awesome. Yep. So um, let's see. We'll do... App Pick One, which is from Zach, um, he has an interesting app that um, he told me about in the Windows, uh, sorry, in the Microsoft Store today, Unigram, which is a telegram for Windows. Yeah, this is a universal telegram client. So if you are if you use telegram on your phone or if you use the Windows, the actual official telegram client for Windows, uh, this is a, universe, a UWP version of that, which is great for multiple reasons. One, uh, it can receive notifications, push notifications when closed. So it's just like a phone app in, in that regard. Uh, two, it's compiled for Windows and R natively. The official telegram client isn't, unfortunately. So uh, you will get better performance using this client if you're using a Surface Pro X, for example. And three, the UI is just nicer. It uses WinUI and looks, you know, you follows the Windows 11 design language. And although it is an unofficial Telegram client, I believe people who work at Telegram do work on this client. So it's, although it is unofficial, it, it does have Telegram's official blessing as far as I'm aware. Uh, and it's and it's really nice. It's fast. It loads fast. It's a UWP app. So it, it well, for the most, I, th I believe it's a UWP app. It looks like a UWP app and it works great. So yeah, I reckon if you use Telegram frequently on your Windows PC, especially if you are using Windows on ARM, definitely give Unigram a try because it's really nice. Nice. All right, app pick two is a gaming pick from our friend Rich. He had to go and spoil. Yes, the way you said that, that one. is a gaming pick. It's a gaming pick. I wanted to make pick. sure that there was some Xbox on the show. This was very, very important. So uh, there's a game. I don't know if anybody's heard of it. It's called Forza Horizon 5. Okay. Uh, there's a new Hot Wheels expansion pack. They've done this before with previous Forza Horizon games, and it's a ton of fun. And as the image showed, you're pretty much driving around on Hot Wheels tracks and... Um, so it it um they announced it not I mean not too long ago, a month or two ago, whatever. But um it's available now. It it came out yesterday. And if you have Forza Horizon 5 Premium, um you can download the expansion from the Microsoft Store or the Xbox app or whatever they're making you download games from today. <laughs> um yeah, sorry. <laughs> um but yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. If you have the premium edition, you should totally go and get it. Like, just watch the video. Like, it's it's so much fun. I was playing it all night last night. If you don't have the premium edition, uh, you can get just this expansion for nineteen ninety nine. Uh, there's an expansions bundle for thirty four ninety nine. But uh, the premium add ons bundle, which pretty much you know uh, promotes you to the premium edition completely, is actually ten dollars off. So that's thirty nine ninety nine. So that's probably an even better deal than just getting the expansions bundle. But yeah, if you've uh, if you've got the premium edition, go get it. Nice. I'm I'm kind of surprised you didn't pick a new game called Stray, which I oh you know goodness. I wanted that to that, I wanted that to be your Xbox pick. Yeah, you know? well, my, I don't do Xbox <laughs> picks. <laughs> my partner but, has been playing it nonstop on the PlayStation really? Uh, really? and loves it. Absolutely loves it, and it seems really cool. It's really well designed. <laughs> Yeah, so it's about it's about cats, stray cats, like in a cyberpunk world or something, right? And now yeah. there's a Twitter, there's even a Twitter account uh, where somebody has started it. It's called Cats Watch Stray on Twitter, <laughs> and it's just pictures of people's cats and dogs. I see Tom Warren's dog That's in there. That's great. 
watching Stray. <laughs> they use like real meows um, of cats and they're, it always changes. Uh, on, I, I, I can only speak for the PlayStation. He's got the PS5. And so when he's playing, the meows come out of the uh, controller itself. So yeah. my dogs are also going like, what the heck is happening over here? Um, and yeah, I think that's part of the reason why pe why people's pets are paying attention is because of the sounds that are playing whenever yeah. uh, the cat's walking around. <laughs> nice. All right. I did not do an Xbox pick, but I do, I do have an enterprise pick. Um, this is another pick from the Microsoft Inspire Partner Conference this week. So, you know, uh, Microsoft's been announcing a lot of things they call industry clouds lately, and industry clouds are vertical clouds. So what they do is they take all the different pieces of stuff they call the Microsoft cloud. So there's Azure, there's Dynamics 365, there's Microsoft 365 slash Office 365, there's a Power Platform, and they bundle these things up with some custom templates and some custom workflows, various APIs, and they sell these things as a vertical cloud. So they already have Microsoft Cloud for healthcare, for retail, for manufacturing. They even have a horizontal cloud that's part of this called the Microsoft Cloud for Sustainability. Um, this week, they announced another one that's kind of a weird outlier in, in a way. It's called the Microsoft Cloud for Sovereignty. So sovereignty is one of these weird buzzwords that's really becoming very prominent um, in the enterprise space. You often hear people talk about data sovereignty. The, that idea is... If you're in a country where there are really strict requirements about, about where data can reside, oh, um, that okay. you need to pay attention to the rules around sovereignty. So what Microsoft's doing is they're creating the this cloud for sovereignty that's going to be customized by partners in the different countries for each kind of custom situation. Um, and it's going to have everything you need around governance, around security, around data residency, uh, a lot of other standards that matter to countries um, in terms of how data is managed, where it's stored, how you how people access it and who can access it. And they're going to sell this as the Microsoft Cloud for Sovereignty. Um, I was talking to a Microsoft partner today, uh, one of my friends, who said, Microsoft's really all in on this industry cloud push. Like, they're really going more and more vertical. Like, every, you hear them talking about vertical this, vertical that, more than ever. And he said, I'm not so sure partners sell that way, right? Like, he, he thinks partners tend to sell more generic solutions that can be applied across industries. So he's wondering how the uptake is going to be on this. But I can tell you, based on some of these sessions I was watching um, at Inspire, this is Microsoft's, this is going to be a new buzzword. When we do our next buzzword drinking bingo card, this <laughs> is going to be on it. <laughs> um, vertical cloud, industry cloud, sovereignty, all those words are going to be very important. And we'll probably hear about them on earnings next week too, I bet. So yeah, that's my enterprise pick. Awesome. Sovereignty. Sovereignty. And now we head into the secrets, secret secrets with the code name pick of the week. <laughs> yeah. So this is a really weird one, too. Um, year, several years ago, Microsoft was working on a, um, some technology through Microsoft Research for doing drone simulations. I don't know if Zach or Rich remembers this, but we were at one of the Microsoft events and they had a maker of drones there and they were talking about how they were working with Microsoft on simulating drones. And uh, um, there's all this cool AI technology behind it. Um, inc including something called Project Bonsai, which Microsoft is based on another thing that Microsoft bought years ago. Okay, so cut to now. Microsoft kills off this AirSim work that they're doing with Microsoft Research. And then this week they launched something called Project AirSim. So add the word project in front of AirSim. And this is a new thing now, right? It <laughs> does the exact same thing. It's, it's simulation for autonomous aerospace vehicles, including drones, planes, um, you know, hobbyist drones, but also professional drones. If you think about the applications for this, it's things like drones that fly over power plants or over crop fields, and they can um, send back images to people so that they don't have to go out to these fields in case something breaks or in case they need to do repairs. Um, the Project AirSim technology, which is, not, which is now in preview, uh, lets you kind of check out how this will look with all these thousands or millions of AI simulations that Microsoft has generated and is making available to customers of Project AirSim. So I, th I was like, oh, this is interesting. They announced this right before 
their Inspire conference. Well, then I found out actually AWS announced some drone technology this week. So that's probably why they announced Project Airsim this week. <laughs> uh, okay. Now that yeah. makes sense. It does. But yeah, that's the code name Projects, Project Air Sim, A I R S I M. All right. And then last but not least, it's time for a drink. <laughs> yes. Um, instead of doing a beer pick this week, I am doing a drink pick. Uh, I've been drinking a lot of this because it's been so hot. And sometimes when it's really hot, I don't even want to drink a beer. That's how hot it is. Like even a cold beer doesn't <laughs> sound like a good drink. So um, I don't know if you guys, anybody on the show or listeners have ever had a thing called Agua de Jaimeca. Uh, it's basically hibiscus iced tea. Oh, and this is what Leo's always talking about. He's oh mentioned man. this stuff a lot. It is delicious. So a lot of Mexican restaurants here, and I'm sure everywhere, have this. So what you do is you brew hibiscus leaves with sugar and water, and you chill it, and then you add some crushed ice, and you add some lime juice, and it is so refreshing. It's like way more refreshing than even drinking water. Um, <laughs> I put a recipe for it in case anybody wants to try making it at home. Like you can get hibiscus leaves on Amazon and you can get them like at specialty markets and stores. Um, my one caution is if you make this, this stains very, very badly. It can Ooh. stain your dishes. It can stain your strainers and spoons and even definitely your clothes. So if you splash any of this on you, you're going to turn bright pink. Uh, but it's worth it because the drink is so delicious and um, refreshing. <laughs> no calories, basically, mm -hmm. or very few calories. And it's good for children, good for adults, no alcohol. I know I'm doing a non-alcoholic drink pick today. <laughs> <What>? but, um, <laughs> it's, it's totally worth making. I've already made so much of it like this past week. I feel like I'm going to turn bright pink pretty soon because I've been drinking a lot of it. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a very, very refreshing iced tea uh, that you should try. Sounds amazing. Um, I, yeah. And like I said, Leo's mentioned it in the past and, um, huh. he made, he made his with, um, a, a sugar-free sweetener and used oh, wow. too much of it. So it resulted in some stomach upset, but, um, oh, no. if you, <laughs> if you, you know, if you play, play it right, then, uh, I think it could probably be very refreshing. That sounds really good. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, I think that brings us to the end of this episode of Windows Weekly. Of course, we have to thank the Mary Jo Foley of AllAboutMicrosoft.com, ZDNet blog. Thank you for your time this week. Yeah, it was great. It was really fun to have the mice come to play while the cats were away. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking of uh, Leo and Paul as cats and um, I guess... Some very grumpy cats, huh? <laughs> yeah. They can be sometimes. Yes, they can. <laughs> uh, and, of course, thank you to our incredible guests, Rich Woods, Managing Editor at XDA. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. This was a, lots of fun. It was. Yeah. It was so fun. Yeah. yeah. We had a great time, I think. Yeah. Like you said, it's like, it's like being at, at Rattle and just talking about Hanging this stuff. Hanging out. Exactly. <laughs> Next time the cats are away, I think we we know who's uh, who's around as well as Zach Bowden, senior editor at Windows Central. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this has been a blast. I can't wait to do it again. Hopefully, we get to do it Yay. again soon. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. I know we have people on Discord saying, "Tell the guests they can come back anytime. Please let them know." <laughs> so, seems to be a win-win. <laughs> yes, an absolute a win. Let me see. One, two, three. Win, win, win. <laughs> uh, <laughs> In any case, thank you all for tuning in this week. Uh, of course, you can check out Windows Weekly uh, as we record the show live every Wednesday starting at 11 a.m. Pacific time uh, at twit.tv slash live. But the best way to get the show is by subscribing to the show, which you can do by going to twit.tv slash www. When you go there, you will see links to subscribe to audio or video. Clicking on those will show you the different places where it's available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. We try to be in all those 
most places. Uh, and also, I should mention, don't forget to check out Club Twit, twit.tv slash Club Twit. For seven bucks a month, you can join the club. I believe it's $84 a year uh, if you want to go for the annual plan. And uh, by joining the club, well, you get quite a few things. First, you get access to your own personal feeds that have no ads in them, so it's just the content. You get access to the Twit Plus bonus feed that has extra content you won't find anywhere else. That's behind the scenes, before the show, after the show, uh, plus some fun stuff that uh, we hosts put out every once in a while. And access to the Club Twit Discord server. That's a place where you can go to chat with your fellow Club Twit members, share lots of funny images, and uh, have a good time, and also chat with those of us here at Twit. Twit.tv slash Club Twit is how you sign up for that. And uh, also, you can now check out, I believe it's it's out. Uh, now I've got to check to make sure. But definitely, uh, you can check out my show that is a Club Twit exclusive show. Uh, it is called Hands on Mac. Don't tell, don't tell Mary Jo about it. Uh, but also, Hands on Windows, which is live. That's Paul Therat's show uh, that is available as part of Club Twit. So great stuff there, twit.tv slash Club Twit to check it out. Um, I think that's that's it. That's it and that's all. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Windows Weekly. Leo Laporte will be back next week as will Paul Therat. And so you'll be able to see them then. Until next time, goodbye. The world is changing rapidly. So rapidly, in fact, that it's hard to keep up. That's why Micah Sargent and I, Jason Howell, talk with the people making and breaking the tech news on Tech News Weekly every Thursday. They know these stories better than anyone. So why not get them to talk about it in their own words? Subscribe to Tech News Weekly and you won't miss a beat every Thursday at twit.tv.